So six years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, visit Jerusalem. I had gone there on work uh, to work on a col collaboration uh, with an education institution. And on the way back from Jerusalem, I chanced upon this book called Startup Nation. And I bought the book and then I read it within a week. It was a very interesting book. And I could see a lot of examples of uh, Israel's successful startup economy and the whole infrastructure they have, both culturally, academically, and the way they uh, you know, make it really easy for companies to uh, get started. And I couldn't, could not have imagined six years ago that we would have the opportunity to invite Saul Singer, the co-author of this book. Um, thank you so much, Saul. Initially, Saul said he'll come only via video conference. And I was a little disappointed. And I said, no, that's not going to be the same impact. But then I also realized that he had a lot of travel at that point. But then a few weeks ago, I got an email from him saying, actually, I'll come to Bangalore. So that was like a really exciting moment because I really think that Israel is a fascinating country. You know, I think the location where it is itself is so full of existential threat. And just seeing people cope and to, you know, make situational leadership decisions. You know, seeing the women in military walking on the road and seeing kids playing chess as the first lesson in every school in, in Israel. I, I went to many schools in Israel and I was fascinated to see that the first lesson in every classroom is playing chess. And I think that is to help them learn about tactical and strategic decision making and to think about how you make the decision and how to reverse it if it is not okay and to also show leadership. So for me, this has been a great takeaway because I think chess has so much to it, uh, much more than any regular you know, curriculum that you learn in schools. So I saw many examples of uh, what Saul has written in his book on drip irrigation technology, drones for agricultural productivity, uh, healthcare, smart cities. Uh, literally, I think Israel has, has, you know, because of all the uh, you know, shortages, it's an arid country. Imagine an arid country being today the biggest exporter of water irrigation and drones for agriculture. And which is why I think the whole collaboration between Benjamin Netanyahu and our own prime minister, I think the MOUs that you all have signed, I think it's, it's, it's the start of some amazing work on you know, giving impetus to our own Startup India initiatives. Uh, so that's why I'm really excited to see you today. And I'll just read a little bit about you. So Saul, of course, is the um, co-author of the best-selling book, Startup Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle which reached number five on the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. The book has been published in over 30 languages. And I really urge all of you to buy this book. I was telling Saul, I routinely give this book to my customers as gifts. So there's so much to learn from this book. So namaste, shalom. Welcome to the stage, Saul. I must say, Ma Nish Ma. Mitsuyan. Thank you. <laughs> so it's really great to be here at, at IMU in Bangalore. It's been a long time since I've been in India, much too long. And I'm really glad that I'm here in person and not on video. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Kiran and uh, the director of, of uh, IIM for making this possible. Um, and I've had an uh, amazing few days here in India. This is my first time in Bangalore, so I am also very excited. So uh, now I want to talk about beyond Startup Nation, because um, we're entering a very different world now in Israel and India, and we're all challenged by this new world. And so we'll start a bit with Startup Nation, but quickly go into the future. And that's why I love the topic of this conference, Sensing the Future, uh, because it, it, it actually really is about sensing, and you'll hear that. So Startup Nation, we call it that because we've got about 6,000 startups, which for a country of about 8 million people uh, is a lot. Uh, we're getting about two and a half times as much venture capital per capita as the United States, uh, maybe about 10 times uh, Europe, uh, again, per capita. Um, 
we do spend the most uh, R&D as a percent of GDP than any other country. Well, we're, we're kind of tied for Korea with Korea around 4.5%. Uh, so these are just kind of some, some numbers why we decided to write this book, why we are calling this Startup Nation. Um, and just one little aspect of why, how we became Startup Nation, um, I think it has something to do with the fact that Israel is a startup. And what I mean by that, a lot of people call things startups, you know, they say, okay, you know, anything that starts, everything starts sometimes, so everything's a startup in some sense. But I mean a startup sort of in the technical sense, because startups begin with an idea. And of course, that idea sounds crazy to most people when they hear it. I'm sure any of you have talked about a new idea, that's the first thing that happens. They tell you it's a bad idea. And the idea of Israel about 100 years ago uh, seemed like a totally crazy idea, a bad idea. And it took a lot of drive and determination and willingness to take risk to turn that idea into a reality. Not just 100 years ago, but continuously till today. And we're not finished yet. So this here on the top, you see um, a bunch of people standing on sand. These are the people who decided to found the city of Tel Aviv about 100 years ago. In the bottom picture, you see Tel Aviv today. So this is... Uh, so startups are no longer enough, though. You know, it's great to be startup nation and all that. And by the way, a funny thing is that I have a Google alert on Startup Nation, and a lot of the things that pop up are from India, because the words Startup Nation have really been adopted by, by India. I, I think that's, that's amazing, and it's true. Um, but and, and the number of startups here, I had a great meeting with uh, the founder and the head of your story, Shraddha, I think, yeah. And uh, she says that there are about anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000 startups in India. Uh, it's very hard to know how many there are. Many are failing, many are coming up. Uh, but so India is building an amazing ecosystem here. But basically over the last few years, five years, two years, every country is getting in the startup game. So startups in some ways are not a differentiator between countries. Every country is going to start building as many startups as they have proportionate to their population, more or less. Um, and that's amazing for the, for the world and for, for every country. But the new kind of landscape, uh, the future of innovation, is not just going to be about startups. And the reason why is that the world is changing so rapidly. You know, think back 10 years. Just 10 years ago, there were no smartphones anywhere. It's hard for us in this room to think of the fact that we lived once without a smartphone. I mean, it did happen. It's hard to remember. Uh, so we think there's been a lot of change over the, next, over the last 10 years. In fact, you know, if you ask the people who founded Airbnb or Uber or Ola or, or any of these companies 10 years ago, would this thing exist? They even, the person who founded it, who created it, wouldn't even have predicted what they themselves did. That's how much has happened over the last 10 years. But the next 10 years, there's going to be much more change. And it's very hard for us to wrap our heads around that. But what this means is that the possibilities are much greater. There's an opportunity to transform big parts of our lives. And that's what I want to talk about. <clears throat> I want to talk about three big transformations. Now, of course, there are many transformations coming up. There's artificial intelligence and you know, robots and all, all kinds of things that people are talking about. But I'm, I'm interested in the ones that when we wake up in the morning and we go to school or go to work, these are the big things that really hit us. And so I'm going to talk about these three. So we'll start with health. 
And we'll start with the problem of health. What is the, the problem we're trying to solve? So this is a, a chart from the UK, from the National Health Service, uh, of all the causes of premature death. That they define that as before the age of 75. Um, from road accidents to everything. And as you can see, the top five causes, uh, you know, heart, cancer, digestive, nervous, you know, these kind of disorders, are causing over 80% of the premature deaths that are going on in, in our lives, in our families. We all know people. And this is a problem, and we're not doing so well. We haven't made so much, yes, we've made progress, but this is, this is plaguing all of us, and we don't know what to do. So, why is it such a problem? Let's take any one of those conditions. We're not born with them. At some point, they're zero in our bodies. And then they start progressing, and we want them not to get to 100. But what's the problem? The way health works today is when do we start dealing with the problem? When we feel bad and we go to the doctor. But that may be very late in the day. You know, in fact, when people say this ca cancer is more deadly than that cancer, what they really mean is the more deadly cancer doesn't have so many symptoms, so you only discover it later, and that's what makes it more deadly. So, this is the wrong way to do medicine. This is, in some ways, not a health system, it's a sick system. We, we need to do something radically different. We need to move the entire thing much earlier. If we could detect cancer, heart disease, any one of these things much earlier, anyone will tell you, and of course it makes sense, that we'll have you know, 90% survival rates, not 10%. We know how to deal with these things at an early stage, but we can't, because we're missing two things. We're missing biomarkers. Biomarkers are just a kind of a sign that says you have a problem. Right now, our biomarker is kind of pain or discomfort. Whatever gets us to the doctor, that's our biomarker. So we need a bio, we need much better. We're, there's a lot of things we don't even have biomarkers for, and the ones we have are not that good. And even worse, we're not taking blood tests every week or a month or, or even every year, so how do we know the biomarker's there? So we need something else. We need sensors. And the beautiful thing about this is, and I hope all of you were here for Dr. Shetty's speech. I think this, that was one of the most important speeches I've ever heard. And he talked about data saving lives. And this is what I'm talking about. And he opened my eyes to all kinds of new ways that data is saving or can save lives. I never thought of it in terms of surgery, you know, that it can affect surgery. It's, it's really everything. But so what's going to happen is that I believe that we meet again in 10 years, more probably like five years or sooner, everyone in this room is going to be using some kind of sensor and it will be measuring what's going on in their bodies. Now that may sound creepy, right? But when we look back from that time we look back at today, we are going to be horrified that we were walking around with no idea what's going on in our bodies. To me, that is already terrifying because I know it doesn't have to be that way. And when all of us have lots of information about what's going on, we will think that we, we won't be able to remember what it was like, just like we can't remember what it was like before a smartphone. We won't be able to remember, and if we do, we'll cringe, that we were walking around with no idea. And it's particularly crazy because sensors are increasingly everywhere. 
Cars have hundreds of sensors. Jet engines have hundreds of sensors. Stores, you know, basically everyone's using data. Google, Facebook, Amazon, everybody is, you know, data, people say is the new gold and so on. It's because it allows you to predict things. So if we start collecting data on ourselves, just like you use data predict, to predict when a car is going to break or when a jet engine is going to break before it actually does, we will be able to move to this world of early detection. Not just because we um, are sensing the biomarkers that we know, we're going to find a lot more new biomarkers because we're going to mine that data, we're going to do the analysis on the data like everybody's doing in all the companies already in order to predict when the machine, our body, is going to break way ahead of when we feel there's a problem. So, quick story about an actual use of this. This is a premature baby in a, a neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, the story is from Toronto, a place called the Hospital for Sick Children. And a new administrator came into this uh, NICU, it's called. And she saw, of course, all the babies were hooked up to many different monitors, you know, heart and temperature and oxygen. And these monitors were basically being used to set off alarm bells so people would come running if there was a problem. But she asked, you know, is anybody collecting the data from all these monitors? And no, they weren't collecting it. And she said, because she came from the world of advertising, she knew that if you started collecting that data, you would find things. So she asked the doctors, what do you want to know? And they said, well, if we could just uh, knew something, of, had some warning of an infection, we could save a lot of babies. 5% die from infection. So they looked at the data, and sure enough, when the baby's heart rate went steady, which you might think was a good thing, that was a sign of infection, 24 hours before they knew about it. So they could start administering antibiotics and they could save these babies. So this is just a small example of how data saves lives. But how are we going to collect this data? And this is, this is fabulous. It happens to be an Israeli company that's doing this called Beyond Verbal. But it turns out that you can use your, your voice as a sensor. There's something called a vocal biomarker. So if you just take a recording of your voice, this is a simple spectrum, you know, frequency. That's how you measure sound. You map it over frequencies. This is not rocket science. You do this, and you get a curve like this, and the green curve is normal, and the red curve is someone with heart disease. Again, you don't need a fancy machine learning to tell the difference between the red and the green. This is now microscopic. <laughs> um, so imagine that you're, we happen to have a voice collection device in our pockets um, called a phone. So it's easy to collect voice. You don't even have to wear a sensor if that creeps you out. So this is kind of sensors without sensors. And, and, and it's not just heart disease. There, there are going to be a lot of vocal biomarkers. There's also breath. Breath has almost as many indicators and stuff as your blood. So instead of taking a blood test, you just take a breath test. Again, non-invasive, just again, you're breathing into your phone all the time. A little piece of hardware, it's all developed, can be embedded in the phone or added to the phone or anywhere you want it. And you do the breath biomarker test. You combine the biomarkers for the breath in the voice, and you combine it with, you know, activity tracking and temperature and stuff like that. You can get on your wrist or your, your make rings now, any sort of form factor you want, measure a bunch of other parameters, and you take those three big collections of data, we're going to find plenty of things. Um, so now I want to go to education. Um, you know, we're all obsessed with education. We're here at a conference of an educational institution. We know how important it is. Um, it, it's what, 
To the extent our countries succeed, a lot of it is due to education. Um, but education is fundamentally broken. And I'll just, again, I'll start with the, the problem. The problem is what's happened, the history. So let's say everyone's farmers. When you're a farmer, you don't need a lot of education. Historically, throughout the centuries, nobody really got ed education. Everyone was a farmer, and you didn't read, need very much. But then the world got more complicated. Uh, people started working in factories. And suddenly, in, in the United States, they did, in, in the 30s and 40s, they did something called the high school revolution. But suddenly, they said, okay, everybody has to go to high school. And, you know, they set this as a standard. And if you went to high school, you were set. You would get a great job. You know, it was, it was great. And in fact, the one big reason why the United States is what it is today compared to Europe is that Europe did this much later. So, but then the world got more complicated again. Suddenly we're working in offices, it's the knowledge economy, the information age, and now everybody has to go to the university. High school isn't nearly enough. But, you know, a few years ago, if you went to the university, you were set. You know, you graduated, you, were, you would get a great job, uh, things were pretty well guaranteed for you. But now, not so much. Uh, in China, in the US, in, you know, uh, everywhere, producing millions and millions of university graduates more than ever, and it's getting harder and harder for them to find the kind of jobs that they are training to do. And at the same time, companies are finding it hard to find the people they're looking for. Now, how can that be? You know, why aren't they finding these people among all those university graduates? So, we can't all get PhDs. You know, we can't keep going this way. Basically, as the world got more and more complicated, we didn't change education, we just got more of it. And that's, we've hit a wall. We're at a complete dead end. So what has to happen? What's the problem? So this guy is Andrei Schleicher. He's the head of education for Europe. If any of you know about the PISA tests, he's the one who invented them. Um, he says, if the, the world economy doesn't hire you for what you know, because Google knows everything. The world economy hires you for what you can do with what you know. So what, what does that mean? What, what, what does that mean in terms of what we're missing? So, the problem with education today is not that it's doing a bad job of what it's trying to do. The real problem is what it's not even trying to do. This is not what we think of, you know, this is not what education is built for. What we need, what, let's say you're hiring an engineer. You can find an engineer who has the right five years of experience and degree and whatever. And there'll be a number of those. So what you're really looking for is the engineer who has those things and can communicate and can work in a team or lead a team who has curiosity. It's not just looking at what they have to do. It's thinking big. We actually have a term in Hebrew for this called Rosh Gadol, which means not just thinking about what they tell you to do, trying to think beyond that. Um, courage. You need courage to speak up if you think something's wrong. So, you know, how do you find engineers who have those kinds of things, who have emotional intelligence, who can make decisions, who can think strategically? None of those things are being taught in school. There's no curriculum for them, there's no test for them. People talk about them, but it's not serious. So, let's look at it this way. The education system today is about knowledge. And we think, well, what else could it be? <laughs> That's what education is. 
But these life skills, those things that I'm talking about, those horizontal skills, 21st century skills, whatever you want to call them, we're just kind of hoping that we pick them up from the air. <laughs> we're, just, we're just praying that we get them somehow. So we need to flip education. We need to focus on those skills. We need to get the knowledge too. We need knowledge more than ever. But knowledge is not fixed anymore. You can't just learn a body of knowledge that is going to take you through the rest of your life. You'll be lucky if it takes you for until next year. The, the knowledge challenge is not just of retraining every five years or ten years. It's going to be continuous. So the, the real education is how to do that, how to keep learning and unlearning and learning and unlearning. And so it's not about a particular knowledge set, except I think you do have to have the experience of learning something deeply. Uh, preferably two things different, di deeply, maybe something in the sciences and something in the humanities. Now, even if it's going to change, you have to understand and feel what it is like to do that. But then you have to be able to keep moving, keep changing that. Um, and in order to do that, you have to have these kind of skills. So how are we going to get them? So. I don't have all the answers. I'm just saying that this is how we have to think. You know, it's like we're not going to get there if we don't even realize that's what we should be trying to do. So we have to start with the realization that education has to be redesigned to get these things, not just make the current system better at what it's trying to do. Try, make education try to do different things, and I think that the secret may be in challenges. Now, the people, uh, you probably heard of project-based learning, which I think is exciting because in a project, you learn how to do teamwork. You learn how to make decisions. You learn how to communicate. You learn how to work with other people. You learn emotional intelligence. You have to have that. In other words, all those kind of skills, you can kind of start learning through projects. And, you know, people talk about project-based education, and, and if they do it, it's like 2% of what they're doing. Maybe it should be more like 99%. Um, but better even than project-based learning, I think, is challenge-based learning. But the difference between a project and a challenge is that a challenge is real. It's not just made up, you know, something you hand the kids to, to do. Part of the challenge, part of the problem solving is finding the problems that you need to solve. And I don't think that that's a problem in India, <laughs> to find problems. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's a good thing, okay? That's a good thing. It's an asset for education. There's so much to do. And our children can start doing it from first grade. You can do it at any level right through university. And in fact, you better get used to it all throughout. And the sooner you start, the less education you'll have to undo. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, so now let's talk about cities. And, you know, when we talked about health and education, we started with the problem. The problem wasn't completely obvious. Um, the problem with cities is obvious. Um, I think we all experience it on the way here, on the way everywhere, every day, for hours. This is the problem with cities, and it's not getting better, it's getting worse. We're in denial, we have no solution. We're so desperate, we think, you know, we're, for a solution, we're, we're, we're excited about driverless cars. The driverless cars are an amazing feat of artificial intelligence and computer vision. It's, it's really unbelievable that we're, we're, we're going to be able to do, do this. It's going to happen. Driverless cars are better than cars with drivers. 
but they're not going to solve the problem. Elon Musk is making driverless cars, and he points out the obvious, that as something becomes cheaper and more available, as your grandparents are sending around cars, and your kids are sending cars, and their cars just, instead of parking, they're kind of zombie cars just wandering around. This is not going to make traffic any better, okay? So what do we do? So what this is to illustrate the fundamental problem why we have traffic in the first place. Because we have thousands of intersections all over the place, we have a flat two-dimensional system, and at some point that system is going to be saturated. We're going to have gridlock, and that's why you can't solve it. Um, so what is the solution? I'd like to share something uh, very exciting that people don't know about, but I really think it could be it. Um, it's turning transportation into three dimensions. Now, these are very thin, low-profile lines. In this picture, actually, it, it, um, the first thing you're probably thinking is, OK, this is a nice toy. This is not going to move millions of people. This is not going to replace cars. Uh, um, but each one of those lines has the capacity of three lanes of traffic. So take that three-lane road and just imagine that you could carry that kind of traffic with one of these. Now, it's maybe counterintuitive, hard to visualize, but it's, it's, it's true. Um, so, and what happens is, if you build a grid of this stuff, so each line has tremendous capacity, but if you build a grid, that grid has really tremendous capacity, partly because you can build a lot of lines for cheap. You can build many more lines than you can of light rail or anything else. But also because it just flows. You know, so it, it doesn't have gridlock. It can't be gridlocked. This is how transportation works today. If you're taking a bus or a train, you get on somewhere, you stop, 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 and you get off, you change, stop a bunch of times again, maybe a third time. If you did the same thing in this kind of network, you get on where you are, you get off where you're going without stopping. You get off at your destination because there aren't really any lines. It's just a network. You can change lines anytime you want. Uh, I mean, it's automated, so you, you just, it, the system directs you whichever is the fastest. Um, so I'd like to show a quick two-minute video uh, that will, I, th I hope, help us visualize this. The video, please. There we go. The city. It's where we live, love, and create. Yet as life moves faster and faster, we move slower and slower. Traffic is just getting worse, and driverless cars won't save us. Because the problem is not the driver, it's the car. It's been a century, and it is time to move on. Skytram is the first public transit system that's as personal as a car. It will unclog our cities and transform our lives. With SkyTran, there's no schedule. Its predictive artificial intelligence knows when you need your ride. Stations are so narrow, they can fit over sidewalks, so they are always just a short walk away. SkyTran's revolutionary magnetic levitation technology enables you to fly on a cushion of air. Traveling in a SkyPod is so quiet and smooth that you can comfortably work or just simply relax. Skypods don't need to pick up or drop off other passengers, so there are absolutely no stops on the way to your destination. In the city, Skypods can fly over busy streets at 50 miles an hour and speed up to 200 miles an hour between cities. With some stations built directly into office buildings, a two-hour commute can be reduced to 20 minutes. 
Skytran's low cost and simple construction allows for many more lines than conventional public transport systems, which in turn allows for greater capacity. Per mile, Skytran is one-tenth the cost of light rail and one-hundredth the cost of a subway. With its speed and high capacity, Skytran can bring an end to traffic. A dream come true. The next step will be something we've never even dreamed of. Transforming streets into parks, cafes, and markets. Without cars, we can breathe, create, and wander. After a hundred years, it's time for a change. So, the only problem with showing the, in, in you this is that it, it will make you feel worse when you're sitting in traffic. Because you, yeah, but um, I know that happens to me. Uh, but I want to say something about what I've learned in the past few days. Why India can do this? Why India is ripe for huge leapfrogs? why India can reinvent things on a massive scale. We've seen that this can be done. Two examples, one private, one public. I, um, I would guess that a bunch of you are using GEO. <laughs> um, I would guess that a bunch of you are using GEO. Uh, what you may not know is that GEO was launched in September 16. Five months later, it was moving a billion gigabytes of data. So India went from 150th in data usage as a company, country to number one. India right now is number one in the world, <laughs> above China, above the U.S. And that's because effectively GEO has made bandwidth free and infinite. You don't have to think about it. You've got the 4G network everywhere in the country. It's unbelievable how, how extended it is. It's extended to places that didn't even have any coverage. So you're going to have people who go directly, who their, their first smartphone will be, a, uh, will be a smartphone, the first cell phone will be a smartphone, and they'll be on the internet. So this is revolutionary. The second thing, and it's going to change a lot of things. It's a platform. Um, the second thing is Aadhaar. Um, this was done in a, essentially a public, not a company, did this, was able to roll out IDs to a billion people extremely fast, extremely cheaply, faster and, more, and cheaper than anybody expected. The acquisition cost, so to speak, of, an, of a new ID was less than a dollar. That's crazy. And Aadhaar is now being as a platform that people are building things on and finding all kinds of new ways to do things. So just the, the, the fact that it's been shown that something can be done at scale, a platform that these kind of things can move quickly, I think will, can drive uh, India to do this in health education, and cities. So, um, oh, I don't know what's that. So thank you. Thank you, Sol. Thank you, Sol. That was a really fascinating talk on sensing the future of uh, cities, uh, education, and healthcare. Particularly liked your example about using voice and breath as biomarkers or as sensors which can become very, very useful biomarkers. And also in my own field, since I'm in the field of education, I really liked your uh, idea of the 21st century competencies and creating those T type of individuals who can synthesize art, humanities, and science. And so we should actually not be talking about STEM anymore, but talk about STEAM with art in the middle. So that's something that, that is hopefully gaining momentum. Um, talking about you know the fact that uh, schools don't have a curriculum for those kind of life skills and 21st century yeah. competencies. There is a school by Ricardo Semler in Brazil called Lumiar Schools. And uh, I visited those schools and they have a curriculum for the entire year to just build a bicycle. 
just sorry. You just build a bicycle the whole yes. year. Yes. You know, you're talking about how education should deal with real challenges. So this is a school here in, in Brazil. I don't know if Fernanda has heard about it. Yes. Ricardo Semler, many would have heard about him. Uh, so that's a very bold vision, you know, to just give them one project for the whole year and then figure out what math, what physics, what chemistry you need in order to solve that problem. So fascinating, lovely to listen to you. Uh, we do have a few questions from the audience. Great. Uh, please, please take yeah. a seat. Okay, the first question here is, India is, Israel is a very connected society. Israel is a very connected society said to have two degrees of separation, helping the rise of startup ecosystem in Israel. How can India being populous to observe a similar startup culture as Israel? So Israel is small, India is large. How do we get there? So I do a lot of speaking around the world um, because the, basically every country is trying to figure out how to become more innovative. And they, they look at Silicon Valley and they say, that's what we want. And then they say, okay, we're not the United States. Can't do that. And then they find out about Israel, this tiny country with you know, no resources in a difficult neighborhood. Uh, and they say, well, if Israel did it, maybe we can do it. Um, so they, they want to know how Israel did it. Um, but Israel did it in a, in a pretty unique way to Israel. But every country, so India is so different than Israel. And yet India has 20 to 40,000 startups. The United States is different than Israel. It has Silicon Valley. So what we're seeing is that every country is building its startup ecosystem based on its own culture, its own history, its own story. Startup Nation is Israel's story. I think there, it's interesting, there are things that can be learned from it, uh, uh, but principally it's that it can be done under practically any circumstances. Um, but what's, I think people are missing is that everyone's gonna build an ecosystem on their own strengths. And I'll just name one enormous Indian strength. First of all, you'll notice about this that everyone's blind to their own strengths. I actually heard on this visit someone saying, well, yeah, we're good at super cheap you know, innovation, Jugad innovation, um, and it kind of denigrating that. So that reminds me of Israelis. They say, oh, we're, we're good at startups. Why can't we build big companies? You know, everybody is complaining about what they're good at. But that's a problem because we're going to build our, our ecosystems, our innovation our, on our strengths. And the fact that India is the world champion at making things at, say, 10% of the cost and 90% or even 110% of the capability and running that at scale, not just in the small country, but in an enormous country. Those three things, no other country can do that like India. And that's what I'm saying, that's what we've seen. And of course, about India, every truism about India, the exact opposite is also true. So we do have pockets of innovation and huge peaks of excellence in so many industries, but we still would like to see at least one state in India be like an Israel or a Singapore. So we can't also keep hiding away from the fact that we're large and you're small and, you know, if we can even pull off one or two states to be, have a culture, an ecosystem which, you know, works across the board, that's something that I think is quite aspirational for us as a country. Um, the other question, I think there was, there was another question with eight votes. Just one, I'll just have time for one more question. So. Okay. Uh, okay, you talked about, this is Dana's, um, about chutzpah. So you talked about aggressive attitude and chutzpah being a differentiator for Israel in your book, Startup Nation. Do you see any such differentiators working in favor of India as a nation? I also want to bring in Professor Raghuram's favorite word, Yichar. The, the, the fear which bottles you up versus the fear which creates energy. 
there's there's a there's a there are two words in in Hebrew, right? Yichard and you know one one is the fear which completely traps you and make immobilizes you, and the other fear really sets you free and makes you do great things. So there is like like Utspa, there's another two words which are very interesting in. Anyway, so uh, yeah, so do you see any such differentiators working in favor of India? Yes. Uh, wherever I go, within about 24 hours, what I'm looking for is energy. <laughs> you can feel when a country has energy. And this country is full of energy. It's full of people who are, <laughs> who are so optimistic about the future. They're so ready to roll up their, their sleeves and, and make a difference in... Uh, and this is, this is a... Um, it's a huge strength. Also, India is going to have a larger population than China. We know that. But it's not just going to be larger, it's going to be younger. And this, what, what Indians call the uh, demographic dividend is going to pay off in an enormous way. At the end of the day, uh, strength of all kinds, uh, economic, whatever, is going to be a matter of human capital. And the younger countries are going to win that. And India is, is the main one um, when it comes to size. And uh, so watch out for India, watch out for Africa, actually. Uh, and it's going to be an amazing next 10 years. Thank you so much, Saul. That was a really, really fascinating talk. And thank you so much for coming to our leadership conclave. Really, really appreciate you. Thank you. You're making the effort. Thank you very much.